One, could Tony, Tony Bobolinsky's testimony taking place right now before Congress take down the Biden crime family? Plus the $454 million bond for Donald Trump. And should you wave to other men? You should drink more water. Off the rails with Pete Hegseth. Two, stories of hope and despair on free speech and a bloodbath. And three, you, the viewer, the listener of The Will Cain Show on Rules for Men. It is The Will Cain Show, streaming live at foxnews.com, on the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page, and always on demand in audio format at Apple, Spotify, or at Fox News Podcast. Just hit subscribe. Or you can watch The Will Cain Podcast whenever and wherever you like on YouTube by subscribing to The Will Cain Show. Right now, in the description underneath this live stream is a link to The Will Cain Show. Just hit subscribe and you can tune in to, for example, exclusive interviews like yesterday's interview with the host of Jesse Waters Primetime, Jesse Waters. Today we've got a big show. There is testimony before Capitol Hill today by Tony Bobulinski and other business associates of Hunter Biden on the links, the truth, the depths of the Biden crime family. And how will Donald Trump come up with $454 million for the state of New York? We're going to break all of that down, plus working the land with my friend, the farmer, Pete Hegg says. So let us start with story number one. He is my co-host on Fox and Friends Weekend. He is my co-host on Off the Wall, Off the Grid, and this segment here on The Will Cain Show, Off the Rail. He's Pete Higseth. What's, What's up, up Pete? You on spring break? You're busy with the kids? You're working the land? I got, yes. So I have kids on spring break, right? We got a blended family. So some are in school, some are out right now. I got my three boys, and I'm trying to raise them to... First of all, clearing the land is so satisfying, Will. Clearing brush is really, George W. Bush was right. It's extremely satisfying. You know that. Now, for a 13-year-old, 10-year-old, and 8-year-old, they think it's torture. But what they've begun to realize after three days of two-hour sessions, and this is only two-hour sessions, Will. This is not like an eight-hour day. You know, I could work them that way. Instead, I'm just doing two hours a day. I mean, just griping on day one, pretty inefficient on day two. Today... They weren't in any better mood or attitude, but they worked and they wanted to get it done and we got it done. And I'm telling you, the amount of land that we have cleared and manual labor, I'm talking uh, machetes, axes. Yeah, I got a chainsaw in there doing some stuff, but it's big stuff, small stuff, green stuff, old stuff, ripping it out. And that's what I figured it out. Why am I going bowling with the kids? Why am I, you know, just playing basketball one on one? Why am I not taking the time in spring break to work up like this is their satisfaction in work. They've they've started to want to work early in the day so that it can be over and so they can be done with it and get it out of the way. That's the whole point. So I'm loving it. They're not. But it's the best. So we're going to get to in just a moment the fact that Tony Bobulinski has been testifying this morning before Congress and the effect that could have on the long term investigation into the Biden crime family. But on working the land. You know, I just got done with the first of my physical challenges for 2024. I just got done with a rowing competition, 5,000 meters on a Concept 2 rower. I'll update you a little bit later in the Will Cain Show on my performance. But rowing is um, it's difficult exercise. It's, it's lower back. It's legs. And I've done things throughout my life athletically that have challenged me physically. But the most challenging thing I've ever done physically, I would say— where I laid in bed at the end of the day, really feeling incapable of movement, was the year I spent working on a ranch in Montana. And we did different jobs. You know, I packed mules into the mountains. I played cowboy. I stretched barbed wire. I I dug fence post holes. But the hardest thing I ever did was bucking bales of hay. So when you hay a field, you know, we would make like 80 pound square bales, not the huge gigantic round bales you see when you drive along the highway, but just 80 pound or so square bales. And then you stack it in the barn for winter. But you have to get it from the field on the ground into a trailer. And then you got to get it off the trailer 
into the barn. And for us, pretty small operation, that meant manual labor. That's picking them up by the strings, by mm -hmm. the bailing wire, lifting it into the trailer stacking it on top of one another onto the trailer, then doing the opposite to get it back into the barn. And man, Hegseth, I mean lower back, and this is when I was 25, lower back, but not just all the normal like blue collar yeah. manual labor muscles, the ones you don't realize the that are part of your body, ones. like my, but my fingers, like grabbing those wires. You wore gloves, but still, I mean, like the muscles in your hands, your fingers. I laid in bed at night, man, and I couldn't uncurl my hands. <laughs> That's the best feeling in the world. And and you know, you're you're we're we're sitting here telling stories about that, right? Not about like when you sat and watched TV or played video games. That's why that's why I play cowboy, Will. I figured you would appreciate this. That's why I play. And my dad was out there yesterday. He's 70. He was wearing a hat and he goes, son, I've never worn a cowboy hat, but it works when you're clearing brush because it keeps the branches out of your head. It's got a lot of functions uh, and it does. And I wore it all day and it's delightful. And you're right. Every muscle in my body hurts. They've been sleeping in because they're exhausted. And they're going to tell stories about that week that they had to clear brush with their dad, something they didn't want to do all the way along the driveway to clear it out when they would never have told stories about how much Madden they played. And that's that's kind of what I'm going for, you know? Few few more quick points before we move on to Bob Linsky. I would normally never endorse a chocolate colored cowboy hat like you just uh, auditioned Come here on. for the show, but I I do notice you've got a nice layer of uh, I don't know if that's wood dust or hay on, dust. on top. So yep, you, you've been I mean, I just came out of the I just work. came out of the field fourteen minutes ago, so I'm sweaty. I'm stinky. Well, it's great. I love the story angle of what you're talking about as well. I, one of my very, very good friends in life, uh, sometimes on vacation or all the times on vacation, I make my boys work out. Like I get them up <laughs> and, you know, they fashion themselves with ambitions in soccer. So like I get them up 7, 7 a.m., 7.30, you know, not not the crack of dawn. Wait and for I, I'd make them go to the beach yep. and, and I'd, I'd make them you know, do uh, frog jumps and, and, you know, tuck jumps and stuff in the sand on the beach. It's great for you. And my friend said, look, the thing is, when they're in their 20s and they're sitting around having a beer together with their friends, these are the stories they're going to tell. Can you believe dad <laughs> made us do this? To your point, not that amazing game they had on FIFA or Madden. Totally, totally. And the griping and so – Character development. You and I both talk about all the show, all the time on the show. We have no idea. There's no manual for being a father. I just know that like hard work is good and building memories is important. And we have this whole playground outdoors. Let's make the use of it and um, sweat while we do it. It's cool. Totally jealous of the Hegseth Ranch. Let's move to the news of the day, the news of the moment, and that is Tony Bobulinski, former business associate of Hunter Biden, is testifying before Congress. Um, so far today, he came out of the gates with guns blazing, accused uh, Joe Biden's brother Jim Biden and Hunter Biden of both perjuring themselves in front of Congress. Uh, there was a statement by James Comer, the, the Republican congressman leading up the Oversight Committee, that I thought was fascinating, Pete. He said, um, uh, he asked this question, which I think is a fascinating question for anyone listening or watching to ask themselves. Outside of when Joe Biden has been in government and including his family, what do the Bidens do for a living? Answer that question. Explain that to someone. How do they make money? What do they do for a living? He said the Bidens do not work in any traditional sense of the word. They do not work as consultants or lawyers or advisors. The Bidens don't sell a product or service or a set of skills. The Bidens sell Joe Biden. The scam is simple. The Biden family promises they can make foreign partners problems go away by engaging the U.S. government. Pete. Uh, you're correct. Their their family business is influence peddling. Uh, but your sort of opening question was, will this Tony Bobolinsky testimony be a, a final crack in the dam or actually? The answer to that is no. The answer to that is definitively no. The answer is so far, none of this has mattered. And I was fiddling with my remote while you were talking because I'm, you know, I, on YouTube TV, you can watch all the different channels and I've kind of been watching throughout. They're not covering it. The, the mainstream press is dismissing this. Hunter Biden is not there. Tony Bobolinsky is someone they've already disregarded, even though he's exceedingly credible. So one of them's talking about Texas immigration law, and the other one's talking about 2020 to and Arizona and votes. Like, they're not covering it. 
So he's credible. James Comer is right. Every step of this, the way they've tried to uncover the influence peddling, the criminal influence peddling that is the Biden name, evidence has been shown. The press, the mainstream press doesn't care and they won't care. And they actually think they're winning on the impeachment front when it comes to Joe Biden. You saw Biden's lawyers write that letter to Comer and others saying, stop, it's over. You, you're not, there's nothing to see here with, with Joe and the family. So they think they have what, what, uh, what's his, what's uh, Jim Biden said from the beginning, what Tony Bobolinsky said from the beginning, which is plausible deniability. And they have said, I don't know. And we can't remember. And I was on drugs. Uh, and all of that has been used to explain away what is quite obviously a political criminal syndicate, but they're going to get away with it, I think, at least up until the election. And you're right. What they f what it feels like has happened to this story is a similar to what um, the left accuses the Donald Trump lawfare strategy of having um, been, which is to run out the clock to drag it out past an election. But there's also another sort of finish line in dragging something out, and that is the loss of public attention. And this feels like the story has moved into the incremental stage. And for the casual viewer or listener, you know, you and I have talked about this, even for someone who's not a casual listener or viewer, someone who even covers the news, there are certain stories that reach a point where it's hard to keep up with every little incremental development. And, and yep. for me, that was the case with the, the war in Afghanistan. It was hard over the years to keep up with everything that happened or wasn't happening in Afghanistan. And quite honestly, it's hard for the casual viewer to understand the ins and the outs, and the incremental changes in, in, you know, the war in Israel. And this has sort of reached that moment where it's like the ball, if at all, it's getting advanced is getting advanced in incremental ways that are imperceptible to the casual news listener. I think that's an important point. It's just like Russian collusion. Remember when, when that was being unraveled and we were starting to get a sense of what was being done behind the scenes, the left just started to just say, man, I, the, the right's talking about the fact that this isn't true, but we know Trump's a Russian agent. And so the narrative started to get sort of baked in, even though three years later, everybody knows it was all bunk. Um, I think this could move in the other direction where even though they're making incremental progress to your, your point, three yards in a cloud of dust, uh, it isn't enough to change the baked in perception that most people have. Of, sure, the, the Bidens were kind of shady, but, you know, they're better than Trump. And so they made a few bucks and Hunter we feel bad for him. And so let's, let's let it happen at the at the ballot box. I, I, yeah, I, I salute the attempts of the House Republicans. I think they should continue. But I don't know that it changes anyone's perception of the Bidens at this point, unless they find something so staggering the mainstream press has to admit it. And that's what Bob Alinsky's testimony should be, frankly. Uh, but it hasn't been received that way. I would ask anybody listening or watching to try that question that I ask out to anyone who seems uninterested in this story. Joe Biden and Jim Biden and Hunter Biden all live lifestyles and have net worth seemingly in the millions. And just answer one simple question. What do they do for a living? What, what is their business? All right, let's move to this. Pete Hegseth, last night at dinner with my two sons, we had a fun family dinner. You know, those kind of spring up out of nowhere where the conversation mm -hmm. just flows and you get to know your kids and you get to know your wife. My youngest son, who is 12, was talking about my older son, who um, has had a long-term girlfriend. And he was preparing unnecessarily for life. He was like, so are you going to marry her? And will she get along with my potential wife? And, you know, I didn't think about wives at all at 12, much less 16. And he said, my youngest son said, well, you guys have to tell me if whoever I am with doesn't vibe with the family, if you guys don't like her, you have to tell me. And I said, <laughs> which I appreciated. I love that he was placing family and the potential for us to all hang out together in the future at such a high priority. But I said to him, hey, West, no one's going to tell you, man, not us, not your buddies. You know, it doesn't matter how many red flags are out there, unless it's just a complete toxic relationship where you're like fighting in front of others. It's it's you are you're the batting average of your friends or family that try to tell you you might be making a mistake is below the Mendoza line. Like it is you bat maybe 150. And what happens is <laughs> you actually lose the relationship with your friend or your family member. You don't break up the, the bad relationship. So as a result. No one tells you. They may try to drop a hint, but no one tells you you're making a mistake in marriage. Your, your assessment is correct. 
Um, what happens between West and that is also puberty and emotions and investment and I'm in love and no one else has been as in love as I am. And this is something people do not understand the depth of this relationship. We've all been there. It clouds all of the judgment. She's the best thing ever. And this is the purest and most amazing thing that will stay true forever. And if you walked in the middle of that, you don't understand. Uh, yeah, it's all coming. And I don't have any kid that's at that place yet. So I'm, those are kind of fun future conversations to think about having. But yeah, I've tr I, I think I've tried a couple of times to hint that or to have that direct conversation. And it, you're right, it, it's only gone completely sideways. I'd like to think though, Will, I'd like to think to his point that with my own kids, I will be that blunt. I will, I, no, 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 I'm, I'm, we'll see. But if there's one of them <laughs> absolutely sideways with just the, the, there's two or three categories that are no go land, then I will intervene. I don't know if that'll go well. There's sort of a viral conversation going around, Pete, right now, what the right age for a man is. And there's no right age, but the ideal age, the optimum age to commit is like, like, when are you ready for, you could do this two ways. Like, is it, you know, 25? Is it 28? Is it six months into a relationship? Is it one year into a relationship? Like, when is it time to go ahead and uh, commit or get off the pot? <laughs> oh, I have not been a privy to that debate. Uh, I think I, I obviously wasn't ready to, I, I obviously thought I was more ready to commit than I was. Uh, I think we let, I, I don't mean to get serious on you, but I actually, this is one of the things I think about a lot with my own kids and their own Christian faith and the seriousness and fidelity with which I want them to take their future partner and view their responsibility and obligation to them, which I think is something that eroded quickly for a long time and then led to a lot of people feeling love and then love feelings are very fleeting and then things don't go the way that they should. And so I do think it, having a deeply baked in Christian ethos is really helpful if you want young men to commit earlier, which I think men should be willing to commit earlier. I think men waiting till they're 35 and finding themselves and then deciding to settle. If that's your thing, fine. I'm not here to criticize everybody. I just think society's healthier when younger people can find each other and build young, robust, strong families. Uh, so I'd like to think that's the case. But if you don't know it yourself and you don't know those things and you're committing, then then it pro committing too soon is probably not a good thing. So I don't have a great answer. And as with most things, I broke every rule, and now I'm trying to reverse engineer it <laughs> with my own kids uh, by infusing them them things that I want them to believe early as they possibly hey, can. Hey, you learn through failure. Uh, back to the um, back to the real quick on the telling someone that they're making a mistake um, <laughs> debate. The, the thing is, like, I think we all have a little bit of experience in this. We have a friend or we have a family member, and I've seen it go bad, and it always goes bad for the friend or, or the family member that tries to help. But I do know guys on the other side of it. I do know guys who, you know, they went through it, and then it, in retrospect, clearly was a mistake, and then they say things like, I wish you would have told me, or I wish you would have been more, you know, adamant or more clear about the red flags, but the bottom line truth is you wouldn't have heard me then you just simply wouldn't have heard me it would be like talking to a brick wall i i think you're I, i'm agreeing with you but i think with some friends dropping certain things at certain times is maybe okay as long as they're not daggers to his pride about like you know her looks or wh whatever it is they've got to be something like, hey, you understand when she does this, that's a little bit of a sign. Be careful. Be on the lookout. And again, with my kids, I'm, I'm going to test your theory, and I'll report back to you in five years or whatever it is. <laughs> but I don't think, like, a teenage girlfriend is warning zone land. You know, it's more like once they get oh, older no. and they're thinking about who I want to marry, that's when you got to throw the red flags up. Oh, no. And then just to be clear, in case anyone this makes it around to my personal circles, this is all uh, abstract and hypothetical. My oldest son's girlfriend is wonderful. This is <laughs> we're about in that marriage land now. we're talking I love about. It. We're in that land. What if the girlfriend's <laughs> this, parents this are is, watching the Will Cain show and are very offended? This You're is, already having to tiptoe. No, I love it. This is all a hypothetical about, about marriage. Okay, speaking of pride, let's move to this. Monday is the deadline for Donald Trump to meet a $450 million bond to the state of New York and Attorney General Letitia James. It's an incredible amount of money. 
And there has been some, like um, Congressman Ted Lieu, who said, Donald Trump claims to be worth billions. How can he not come up with $454 million? To that, many are like, why does every Democrat seem to not understand business? Even Mark Cuban said, hey, man, just because you're a billionaire doesn't mean you're liquid to the tune of $454 million. Kevin O'Leary, Pete, um, from Shark Tank, Mark Cuban's co-host, was on um, Outnumbered yesterday. And here's what he had to say about this judgment. Yeah, I don't think it's a case about Trump at all anymore. Uh, I think people should be thinking about the policy being put in place here, the competitive, competitiveness of New York State versus other U.S. states, but more importantly, the message about the American brand. Hmm. You think about America, the reason this is the number one economy on Earth is that we have laws and we have due process and we have property rights. It attracts foreign capital from all around the world. All of that is being shaken to the core here. So, Pete, obviously the implications are bigger than simply for Trump. The options seem to be as follows. Um, he can raise money from from supporters, which um, reports are he's not interested in doing that. He's not sort of interested in hat-in-hand donations. He can be declare bankruptcy. Um that seems to be a point of personal pride that he never has personally declared bankruptcy. So that doesn't seem like a real option. Um, C can do nothing in the state of New York can can take over properties. There's reports about 40 Wall Street being a building they could take over. But I don't think the state of New York wants to run one of his properties. And if they try to make a fire sale, you know, and and sell it, I mean, A, that's not done very quickly. And B, they would way undersell it. You know, they would way undersell it. I, the, the the options are really not very good for Donald Trump. Yeah, this is actually weighed. I've, I've actually thought about this a lot, and it's really bad. Uh, by the way, I don't agree with Kevin. O'Le- I like him a lot. Um, this is not about the business environment. He said that on a lot of in a, a lot of shows in a lot of different ways, which I, I respect the point. But this is about Donald. This is about Donald Trump. Okay, Joe businessman is not going to get this treatment in New York City now. Someone like Trump in the future, maybe uh, I get the idea of an equal scales. And that is, a, but this is a Trump, you know, a- economic assassination attempt that Letitia James is trying to make. She wants this man out of New York City, this man embarrassed, this man put in a place where he can't come up with the cash. All of that is true about a billionaire and liquid assets of property. There's no doubt about that. I think Trump should challenge this based, I don't know where this is, and, and you know the levels of challenge. What about the Eighth Amendment, sort of imposing excessive bail, excessive fines? You know, that, I feel like he's got a damn good case there on the Eighth Amendment to say $500 million? What, because I'm a flight? What, what's the, the bail here on that is excessive um, and fight it in that direction? I don't know what he does. I, he was not going to ask supporters. You're exactly right. Although I've had people reach out to me over email elsewhere saying, how do I donate? to Donald Trump, which is an amazing view of how people feel about this. He's been willing time and time again to go to the courtroom to say, hey, I'll go to court because I'm fighting on behalf of you. And that has resonated for him inside the primary and in his poll numbers. It's a whole nother thing to say, they're taking my assets and I'm doing that for you. They're taking Trump Tower. They're taking my golf course and they're fire sailing them at a tenth of their value. Like this is a guy who is a businessman at his heart who has pride in that business, who has sons who will take over that business and believes should live in a country where that's possible to do. This to me is going to get really gnarly. I don't know what, I don't know what it's going to look like. I, I, and the fact that you can't find an insurer willing to underwrite it because of the real estate portion of it. I don't know where it goes, but the left is going to love, love, love this. And they want to put a for sale sign on everything they can for Donald Trump if they can. The insurer and the real estate has a lot to do, by the way, with the the economic environment right now and the and the rate, the high interest Correct. rates. Like people are just worried about commercial real estate. But a um, couple of points. So, so Trump will certainly go to the courtroom. He will appeal. He may make an Eighth Amendment argument. He certainly, I think, has a good chance of winning at least at the time it gets to the Supreme Court. But that takes time, and he has to satisfy this bond before any of that can take place, which makes this so precarious come Monday, come Monday, this has to be resolved because the state of New York is not bending. And, and I, I will say this. Why would they? uh, Why would they? 
Why would I, they bend? They, they got their guy in the crosshairs right. in their mind. And and you're right. Both you and Kevin O'Leary are right. Okay, so here's the thing. O- O'Leary is right in that Trump is a little bit of the glass breaker. So, you know, famously Donald Trump said, they're not after me, they're after you. I'm just standing in the way. And, and to some extent, that's true. So what has been done against Trump has been done against people who fall outside the bounds of acceptable groupthink or ideology. On, on much, much minor, more minor levels, like, you know, free speech on social media as dictated by the government. That's been argued this week, by the way, in front of the Supreme Court. More on that coming up on The Will Cain Show. Um, the lack of due process for people involved in January 6th. There's a lot of ways in which, you know, this whole system of lawfare has been used against the little guy and not just Donald Trump. And it's not hard to to envision a future in New York where if you have the wrong politics, the wrong advocacy, um, you fall outside of acceptable ideology and groupthink, that you could also suffer economically uh, through real estate or lawfare in the same way that's been done with Donald Trump. It's, it, it, it requires a leap, but I don't think it's a huge leap. But you're also yeah. right that this is a personal vendetta, all of it, against one man. And she said when she ran that she would go after Donald Trump. So, yes, it is about Donald Trump, but it's not a great leap to think it could soon be more than Donald Trump and, and about America. Last thing I'd say on this, on this bond, let's say he does nothing. Okay, he does nothing, and that allows the state of New York to, to, to take a building, whatever that building may be, 40 Wall Street, Trump Tower. Okay, then they've got to do something with that building, and, and they need to satisfy their money. So do they sell it? What do they do? I think there is, and who knows what the value of public relations is at that point, that's ugly. Like you just described, taking someone's property like that, fire selling it for a tenth of the value— I'm telling you once again, not everything is politics. That's serious hickey on his personal net worth and so forth. But that's ugly, ugly politics. It gets really obvious in even more obvious ways to the casual American. You're exactly right. It's really ugly. It, it could be like a Mar-a-Lago raid type moment on steroids, uh, not just amongst the Republican base, but amongst people that say, really, really? Um, and it. But at what point does helping him in the polls, I mean— that trade-off becomes impossible, and I, th- I think he fights it more based on what his viable business interests are in the future vis-a-vis is this going to – I mean, this is now – we're now talking about his own personal wealth. This is a personal thing. I mean, he'll, he'll do everything he can to fight it. There's no doubt. But if it comes to that, um, I don't think we know what that looks like. Can you imagine? Like Letitia James is showing up at Trump Tower saying this is ours now. Get, every, get all your stuff out. Uh, that uh, we – a former president – Unchartered. No idea. All right. Another dinnertime conversation last night uh, where you came up, Pete Heck said. Yesterday here on The Will Cain Show, Jesse Waters uh, was on, and he laid out some of his rules for men. We'll do more of that a little bit later on The Will Cain Show with your interaction from viewers. He's got a lot of rules for men. Um, and it, and you know, you have said to me on numerous occasions, a man should not wave. I think your specific rule is a man should not wave on television. I don't know if it if it extends to a man should not wave. So last night at the dinner table, we really broke this down, Pete. Like, so the kids and the wife were like, "Yeah, Will, you do kind of do this on TV sometimes, and yeah, <laughs> it's a little effeminate." So then we started like breaking it down. Okay, well, but does this mean you never wave? You know, I mean, like. The wife said, "Will you do this sometimes?" And I'm like, "Is that bad? Is that worse, or is that better?" <laughs> you know what I'm doing for those listening on on podcast format is I'm doing the whole close finger clasp thing, you know, bending them down. Um, and then there was a debate. No, no, no. You can, but like dudes do things because they inherently know that waving is a little effeminate. Like they do things like just raise their hand, be like, "Hey, sup," and then you don't. You, I've got my hand in the air, and you don't move the hand. You don't do the the twists or the turns in the hand. You just hold it up. Or, or guys do like uh, two fingers up or one finger up, like, what's up, you know, as they raise their hand like that. So what are the rules for waving? So I will, I will first say, as you went through this long explanation, I realized how foolish it is that hand waving is somehow my Alamo of personal pride, considering all the things we do <laughs> on Fox and Friends, right? Like we do... All these things that are meant to degrade us and make us look foolish and ridiculous, but my stand my ground moment is waving on the show. 
I guess I just, I watched <laughs> over the years on the show, I've watched so many masculine men like in the green room or in teases, the camera gets on them and they don't know what else to do. And so they do the wave. I'm not even going to do it on your, I'm not even going to do it on your show because I don't wave, <laughs> but they, they do a wave and they are like, dude, that dude should not be waving. That was a Navy SEAL that like killed a, like a lot of guys. He should not be waving. That looks bad. But and now there's a camera in his face, so he's going like this. <laughs> yeah, don't do not do Give a thumbs up. Give a salute. You can give a point. You know, whatever you want, a little fit. I, I don't care. Just just don't wave. I believe that you can wave to little kids, okay? It's nice to give a little, I like to, you know, a sweet little girl or a little boy, you wave to him, like Margarita in the green room, a little wave. Cute. Um, maybe my wife comes on set. Cute. But otherwise... I don't, I don't really make waving someone down. Like I can see that that has a function. What but if you actually, see somebody across the, what if you see somebody across the stadium or across the, the bleachers at a game, another dad, like, and you kind of like, Hey, what's up? What, what do you do? Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I think that's I do the station, than, the stationary very hand raise. different than your wave, which is like, <laughs> that's of that. You can't do that. <laughs> Howdy doody. Howdy doody. <laughs> a little howdy doody at shoulder level back and forth. Often anymore, but every once in a while I catch it. It's just a small TV rule. Don't wave. Not good for men. Um, you know who I like? Hawaii has this figured out. I think the shaka, the hang loose, is a great little greeting. It's a great little, hey, what's up? And But there's there's nuances to it. You know, okay, pinky finger, thumb, out. But, like, if you're, around, if you're in Hawaii a lot, you'll notice, like, local guys, it's very casual. Like, meaning... You don't, like, overextend it. You don't, like, really get the fingers out there. It becomes a real, like, oh, he's, he's doing it. It's, 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 you can almost barely see it from the fist. And you certainly don't, you know, give it a, you know, the, the cartoonish twist of the wrist. You just do a little <laughs> bit of, you just do a little, like, one hook. You just do, like, yeah. a, like, a little, like, a fish hook. You just go whack. Or you do nothing. You just hold it out. I think Hawaii's got it. Every state should have a hand greeting. I love that. I like that. I just do, I think I do this the most. What's up? How's it peace, going? you know, yeah. You do I peace. I do that. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't do why. peace. I, do I don't peace. know. I don't like that. I don't like peace. I think I just... generally, but I do peace. Yes. <laughs> it's such a terrible thing to say. <laughs> Everybody likes peace. Okay, fine. I like Not peace. Pete. I like war. <laughs> <laughs> How's water going? By the way, Hank oh, said. Great. By the way, uh, he's been fighting a headache. I even allowed he's my been kids fighting to have a, head, a water bottle. headache for two months. <laughs> I, I even allowed my kids to each have one water bottle while doing work. Um, hydration is the key, Will, and you said it, and you were I right. Know. And I took away nicotine. I took away caffeine. I took away everything else. And Alcohol. it didn't change until I added a lot of liquid, and then the dull headache went away, and it's a beautiful thing. It's hydration. I've been on do. the water now. I, I advised you, but I like most things in life, I'm all talk. I wasn't really drinking a lot of water. And um, so then, like, I told you, hey, man, you need to drink water. And so I started drinking water. And I chug, like, I wake up before I have coffee, I chug a glass of water. You know, I have my coffee, I have my breakfast, I have a Zen. Then I chug another bottle of a glass of water. And I'm trying to, like, I'd say I'm probably good in a good five or six, you know, just cups, whatever those are, 16 ounces. And I don't drink them. See, here's my thing. I love ice water. Like, love, love, love mm -hmm. ice water. But I realize I'm always drinking ice water, and you don't really drink it. You sip ice water, and you only end up ever drinking half the cup. So now I'm just doing t uh, room temperature water, chugging it four or five times a day in the bathroom a lot. A lot of bathroom trips That's now. That's a big downside. But big downside. It's, I've even the energy out. It's, it's just more consistent energy. That The water has led to more energy? The water? Yes, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. I've just thought about it in the context of sleep. Sleep has been better. Uh, I feel better in the morning. I've seen my energy level stay stronger without caffeine, which I'm still not doing because my wife drinks decaf. And so it's an easy switch for me because she's already on it. And when I'm not going like this with the energy level just stays straight the whole day. I don't know. I, I love it. Maybe if I add even – I'm falling behind in the water. I, I believe in you, but I, I'm not doing the six cups a day consistently like you. I, I'm grabbing a vitamin water more often than I otherwise would or drinking water more often than I otherwise would, but I'm not a regimen. i got to get on it. Are, 
Next, there are rumors about Donald Trump's cabinet, Pete, who that could be. There are talk about um, Vivek. This is according to Fox News. It was on Fox and Friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, potentially DHS. Interesting names for attorney general. Um, uh, Mike Lee, senator from Utah. Ted Cruz, senator from Texas. I think Ted Cruz, you know, I, I think he would actually be a perfect attorney general. Oh, go, go. Inside that cabinet, Go. Just pick up every hard charging knife fighter, America first, non uncompromising, principled, smart fighter, and just unleash them. Like, don't, because in the first term, what you had was a, a political novice in Donald Trump picking people that kind of looked the position, and and but but their their compass on his agenda was unclear. We know where people's compasses are now. He knows that. He wants that. And after what he's gone through, they're about to seize his building, okay? Pick a secretary of education that's going to help abolish the Department of Education. Pick a, you know, head of the DOJ who will actually, you know, enforce the law we believe it should be enforced. Yes, so yes, all the way and amen. This People don't vote based on the cabinet, but I think your energy level and your excitement amongst conservatives in the base is going to be galvanized by a clear set of this is where we're going. This is where we're going to bat when we get a chance. I was heartened to see those reports. Uh, it's wonderful. It's a little ahead of ourselves at this point. We're we're dealing with forty five, four hundred fifty four million dollar bond and other pending cases and the stuff we've already talked about. But it's motivating to think about what that could look like. I, I agree with you. People don't vote on the cabinet. I will say for any friends that are moderate conservatives or country club Republicans, I'm not saying that disparagingly, but this is something they bring up all the time. Like, who's he going to be surrounded with? What's the competency level of the people that will be executing the job? But I think you're right. We're ahead of ourselves. And, and in you know, in opposition to so many other things we talk about in the news, we'll see what this Tony Bobolinsky testimony in front of Congress, this $454 million bond seems like a real thing that is coming towards a day of reckoning. And that's a story that feels like it has an inflection point that will command all of our attention within Big time. just a couple of days. By the way, kudos uh, I'm glad to, to break you. it down with uh, you today. You were all over the bloodbath thing, which has been such a stupid cycle of their attempt to impugn. Uh, so for, for people inside our show, it was Will in the 830 hour that was like, yo, we got to do this more because this is coming. And I'm seeing this all over Twitter. So we did it at the top of nine and then it exploded for the next 48 hours. But good eye. And they're uh, still on it. Have that kind of eye on everything. We do. And they're still on it. I was told that yesterday on, for example, the Today Show, which is to me, the Today Show is the definition of the casual news viewer. Right. They're still editing the clip and saying that he's calling for political violence, that he's calling for a bloodbath. It's still alive, this hoax. Mm -hmm. And so we will, as you point out, we will be vigilant. All right, Pete Hegseth, get back to work in the land, man. Thanks for doing Off the Rails. man, chocolate hat. Let's do it. See you. Peace. Have a great show. Go get it. See you, bud. Uh, Quick update. I told you yesterday that I have committed to four physical challenges throughout 2024. I'm working on what the second will be, but I just completed the first. It is, it was nine weeks of training on a Concept 2 rowing machine leading up to a 5,000 meter race. I completed that race on Monday morning. At the beginning of the training regimen, I averaged a two minute and seven second 500 meter pace. That put my 5,000 meters at roughly 21 and a half minutes. I shaved two minutes off that time and 10 seconds off my 500 time. So I did a 157.9. My overall time was 19 sec, 19 minutes and 39 seconds. So it's almost 20 minutes on the Concept 2 rower. I would tell you a couple of quick points. My hands are torn to pieces. They're callous. They're blood blistered. And my family is tired of hearing about rowing. So on to the next physical challenge. Second, rowing is incredible exercise. Love it. Full body workout. I hate cardio. I hate running. I will do rowing any day. 20 minutes, pretty much full tilt. It's not a sprint by no means, but you're pushing your pace the whole time. I I did like a a 158 average over my thousands, five one thousands, you know, consecutively. Slowest 159, fastest 156. Um... It, it, just to push yourself like that, which leads me to the third thing, 
This was nine weeks. There was people from the United States, United Kingdom, Nicaragua, all over the U.S., and it's a community I've gotten to know over the last two years. I have several buddies in there, a lot of people I don't know. There's world record holders in rowing. There's normies like me. Um, competition is everything. Competition is everything in life. Like if I worked out, I would have told myself, oh, yeah, that was a hard workout. Nah, there's another 20% that I don't even know I have that you only tap into because you're trying to beat your buddies because of competition. I loved it. I recommend the rowing machine. I recommend signing up for physical challenges. I've got three more to go. I know one of them is going to be the Navy SEAL swim in August. But I certainly recommend competition in the economy, in business, in life, in exercise. Compete. It's good. It's good for the soul. All right. You heard Pete bring it up. Bloodbath. A story of despair on a real advocation for bloodbath in America, but also a story of hope that there are Supreme Court justices that understand free speech. That's coming up next on The Will Cain Show. Cudlow on Fox Business is now on the go for podcast fans. Download the Cudlow Show podcast every weekday at foxbusinesspodcasts.com. Cudlow covers the latest headlines and business trends with an emphasis on the financial impact facing households and businesses across the country. Listen to interviews with key business newsmakers. The Cudlow podcast will be available on the go after the show every weekday at foxbusinesspodcasts.com or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. Exclusively on Fox Nation. It's time. The evidence that's come out is very compelling. For justice. The only thing worse than being accused of a crime is knowing you're guilty. For vengeance. They were as unlikable a pair of defendants as you'll ever see. None of you guys are 21, right? For. I am not drinking a little. Really bad decisions. I'm drinking a lot. It's time for crime. Only on Fox Nation. All part of Fox Justice. Sign up now and get your first year of Fox Nation for $29.99. America is streaming. I'm Charles Payne. Listen to my Unstoppable Prosperity podcast so I can get you making money right now. 35 years on Wall Street taught me how to successfully invest in the stock market. In my four-part series, I'm going to teach you too. Some of Fox Business's finest joined me to help tell my story, impart crucial lessons from my Unstoppable Prosperity book, and to give you the tools to achieve your own financial dreams. Listen anytime, everywhere at foxbusinesspodcast.com or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Men should not drink out of straws. Men should not eat soup. Men should not lick ice cream cones. Those were some of the rules for men, according to our own Jesse Waters, right here yesterday on The Will Cain Show. What are your rules for men? That's coming up in just moments on The Will Cain Show, streaming live at foxnews.com, the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page, and on demand by subscribing to The Will Cain Show. Right underneath this video in the description is a button. Subscribe to The Will Cain Show on YouTube. We have been all over here on this show, the bloodbath hoax over the last several days. The implication is that Donald Trump is calling for political violence, that he is asking for another January 6th. We can acknowledge, and we should acknowledge, January 6th was a riot, but a shameful riot on our nation's capital, caused destruction and chaos. January 6th was not an insurrection. It was not a concerted attempt to overthrow the government. It was not a violent day that led to the death of police officers. One person died, Ashley Babbitt, one of the writers that day. Those are the truths behind January 6th. And no one should advocate for political violence. It's my contention in the search for the truth. That's not what has been said when Donald Trump said the country, should he lose, should expect a bloodbath. But I can give you an example in a bit of a moment of despair for America, I can give you an example of a politician openly advocating for what amounted to a bloodbath. I give you now Vice President Kamala Harris in 2020 talking about riots across the country under the banner of BLM. Here she is on the Colbert Report. They're not going to stop. And that they're not, this is a movement, I'm telling you. They're not going to stop. And, and everyone beware because they're not going to stop it is going they're not going to stop before election day in november and they're not going to stop after election day and that should be everyone should take note of that on both levels that this isn't they're not going to let up and they should not 
Kamala Harris in her patented style of sounding like she's giving a book report on a book she has not read, repeating the same phrase, sentence, or catchism over and over in only slightly different variations. They're not going to stop. Got it. She's talking about the riots where at least 25 people were killed across the country. Billions, I think the numbers in trillions in property damage across the country. Businesses burned, police stations burned, cities burned. By any traditional definition, this was a bloodbath. By the way, I think that number 25 is probably low when you you do a full survey of uh, it's it, people think that's an interaction between rioters and law enforcement. That's between rioters. This was a bloodbath for the country. And here was somebody who is now vice president advocating for it not to stop. I don't I, I don't think she was simply making a prediction. I mean, she was making a prediction, but I don't think she was simply making a prediction. She was heralding it as this fight for justice, and they won't stop, and they won't stop. Underlying message, because they're fighting for something worthwhile, and so therefore this fight is worthwhile. Therefore, this bloodbath is something to be praised. That is a politician. That is a politician speaking admiringly about a bloodbath. On the other hand, yesterday we talked to you about a Supreme Court justice in Ketanji Brown Jackson who seems to have no conception or openly rejects the civilizational foundational value of free speech and the enshrined right of the First Amendment. But I didn't want to leave you with just a negative view. I want to share with you a positive understanding as well. Justice Samuel Alito, in cross-examining government lawyers, talked about um, the First Amendment of the United States and whether or not the government can deputize or make a social media company a subordinate in its goal to subvert the First Amendment, abridge free speech, and censor. Listen to Justice Samuel Alito. And so I thought, you know, the only reason why this is taking place is because the federal government has got Section 230 and antitrust in its pocket, and it's, uh, to mix my metaphors, and it's got these big clubs available available to it. And so it's treating... Uh, Facebook and these other platforms like their subordinates. There you go. You can't deputize social media. You can't do it through the back door. The First Amendment is the First Amendment. You can't harangue, email, yell at Facebook. You can't threaten then Twitter, now X. But that's what the federal government seems to have done. Those were oral arguments for the states of Missouri and Louisiana um, sue over this censorship. We'll keep you updated on what the Supreme Court decides. But there's a bit of hope. And it's not to be unexpected. I mean, Alito, certainly Thomas, these are solid, sterling legal minds that sit on the Supreme Court. And they have the majority over the minds of Kentonji Brown Jackson. All right, coming up, rules for men. You've now contributed. If we're making a rule book for men on shoulds and should nots, do's and don'ts. You have contributed your chapter. What can men do? What can men not do? That's coming up next on The Will Cain Show. Stay on top of the latest forecast with America's weather team in the palm of your hands. Here's the latest from America's Weather Center. It's Fox weather updates throughout your busy day, every day. Five inches of rain by tomorrow. Temperatures being 30 degrees above average. Put the power of over 100 meteorologists and the worldwide resources of Fox in your hands with the Fox Weather Podcast. Precise, personal, powerful. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com. Is this the start of a NASCAR dynasty for Ryan Blaney? Ready to go to work. A redemption tour for Chase Elliott. Is Denny Hamlin a ruthless competitor or a villain? Is it time for a Bubba Wallace breakthrough? For Ross Chastain to give back to breaking stuff? Or is this the making of the wildest ride you'll ever witness? Yeah, it's all of the above, and it's about to go down. Yeah! Let's go! Woo! The Echo Park Automotive Grand Prix, Circuit of the Americas, Sunday at 3 Eastern on Fox. 
the Fox News Podcast Network. I'm Emily Campagno, and this is the Fox True Crime Podcast. And I had nothing to do with her disappearance, but people still accuse me of it. I sit down with the people who lived the nightmares. I was in shock. I was just devastated. The investigators who tirelessly worked on the case. I feel for their families, and I really hope that they can catch this guy. Bringing you closer to the story than you ever thought possible. Listen and follow now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Rules for men. Don't drink out of a straw. Don't lick an ice cream cone. You're not allowed to have a best friend. That's according to Jesse Waters, who has a new book out and joined us yesterday here on The Will Cain Show, streaming live at foxnews.com and on the Fox News Facebook and YouTube pages. Uh, Jesse has an instinct. I'm going to give it to him. He doesn't need the compliments. His humility is hard to find. Jesse has an instinct. He, he has the ability to see it quickly. Like, you know, that's not right. And he's pretty much, in my estimation, he might be batting a thousand. Like, when he described the soup situation, which received a lot of pushback on social media, he's right. I don't want to see another man at the dinner table pursing his lips as he brings a spoon to his mouth. There's no way to drink out of a straw and look manly. And agreed. I don't know that licking an ice cream cone is effeminate, but I just don't want to see another man. It's like, it, it's, a, it's emasculating. It's, it makes you a child licking an ice cream cone. So he has gut for these things, does Waters. So we thought we'd open it up to you as well, like, what are the rules for men? Uh, let's bring in the crew. Let's bring in two-a-days Dan, uh, young establishment James, and a tinfoil Pat. So the viewers and the listeners uh, two a days. They, they've they've um, contributed some new rules or pushed back on the offered up rules. They pushed back on both. Just to go off the soup one. So Stephanie Murray on uh, on X said gumbo in Louisiana is perfectly fine for men to have as a soup. I think she's right. Thing. I think that's fine. It's manly, you know. And maybe chili. I would throw in there. Chili's fine. Oh, chili. Well, chili's not soup. Well, chili's not is soup. It? So like, no. Chili's not soup, and it, so this does not need clarification. Okay, fine, fine. All right, so we no, have- no, no need to even put an asterisk here because I think it should be understood that chili's not soup. And here's what I would say about gumbo, mm-hmm. and I think Jesse was onto this: the chewier, the more manly; the waterier, the less manly. And so gumbo has the rice in it, you know, so it gives you something to sink your teeth into as a man, you know, as you're eating it, you know, you're not slurping it. So, and that's why I think he was talking about the benefits of like a chowder with crackers in it, which I don't like. That's like a big bowl of cream to me. I don't like soup in general. Um, I don't even like stew. Now what I'll do is I'll pick out the meat and potatoes and eat it and leave the broth sitting there. Uh, I just don't want water on my food. That's so, that's a weird thing to do. I'll just put that out there, but that's fine. To each his own. <laughs> um, and just more manly. It, I agree. Apparently. Um, so moving on, we had someone uh, put in Brandon Sup from X said, you forgot, mentioned never use an umbrella is a weird thing. I don't get I like this it. one. What? Imagine being so insecure in your masculinity that you couldn't use an umbrella when it's raining. Come like, on. Just get wet Here then? We go. What are you Come doing? On. I saw this comment that young establishment James is offering up. A man should be able to do whatever he wants. A man does what he's free to do. A man shouldn't <laughs> be insecure. <laughs> That's fine. That's cool. Yeah. But but he, you're just not being honest. you got to be honest. Other men judge you when you walk around with a parasol. That's the truth. It's a little bit of water. You're fine. I don't want to see you walking around with an umbrella and a parasol. Tell me the difference. You know, what's the difference? And you're walking around, and I get it. I don't like getting wet. In New York in particular, that's the worst weather there is. Snow, everything's better than rain in New York. Because you know what happens in New York? You get wet. In the rest of the world, you're making a quick dash to the car. You know, in and out of a building, quick dash to a car. In New York, you're walking in it, and you're getting wet. And I get it. But the umbrella... Sorry. No. It's not not manly. I have a 15-minute walk to Grand Central to and from work, and it is downpoured, and I've been soaking wet, and I was pissed that I forgot an umbrella, and I wish I had one because I would rather look as stupid as possible than be drenched walking in New York City going to the train. Patrick, what do you think about this? Can I say the, the – um, oh, I'll get tinfoil in here. Here's the thing about umbrellas. You never have it when you need it. 
it's a good worthless point. accoutrement. That's true. That's um, true. Now, there's good ones, by the way. Weatherman, Weatherman Umbrella, Rick Reichmus Company, those are awesome umbrellas, by the way. Good, sturdy ones, you know what I'm talking about? They do mm-hmm. feel more manly. They're, they're, they're sturdy. But this is why those guys in New York make so much money. They clean up. The guys that pop up when it rains and sell the cheap umbrellas. Because <laughs> you'll shell five real quick, right, to not be I wet. I have. I have before. But, because you never have an umbrella when you need it. So worthless accoutrement, tinfoil, Pat. Yeah, I, I am from uh, Jacksonville, so I uh, do not subscribe to the umbrella idea. It's in and out. You're not outside very long, you know, and, and you don't want to be out in a thunderstorm anyway, like you are here in the south. So especially with something like a lightning rod. So like what's unmanly about it? I don't get it. Like holding it like this, like with one hand. just you Yeah, know. it's like you look at the... 1900 uh early 1900 movies and the ladies carry them around dudes aren't carrying them around it's just you, i don't your know your fist even as you even as you <laughs> pantomimed holding an umbrella your fist looked effeminate <laughs> i saw that as i was doing it <laughs> i was like i should probably stop doing that right now you held up that delicate pale fist that <laughs> 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 was, was holding a, f- a f- phantom umbrella handle <laughs> No more miming. And you actively lost testosterone. <laughs> no more miming on the show for me is what I'll I'll go with. Um, all right, so moving on. So you said so. Gabe Walker said this: men do whatever they want. That was a comment we got. Yeah, you know, men just do that. Yeah, there's so there, simple. There you are, James. Makes sense. All right, we have a really <laughs> so good one here. This this is a hill I will die on, yeah. which I agree with. This next one, Scott uh, Macon, I think is how you pronounce it. Never wear a jersey of a player that is younger than you. And I agree with this one completely. I mean, I've generally been anti-Jersey altogether. Um, but, you know, as I've leaned into my fandom, my especially, I mean, I'm being real here, especially my on-air fandom, I've thrown the Dak jersey on. Like, I did it on first take. I did it during the playoff That's tough. run or, around the house. I know. I don't think I'd wear it to a game. I don't. I don't. I don't think I would. Have I gone... I might, I might have to take ownership of this one. I don't I think, might I don't think a grown man something. should wear another man's jersey with the name on it. I wear, the, right. wear the jersey without the name, that's fine. Wear a Cowboys jersey. But the name just throws a weird element into it for me. Football jerseys are a difficult one the- because they're, they're very personalized. Yeah. So, like, because they have the number. I think hockey jerseys and baseball jerseys are probably the easiest ones to get away with because it's just the logo and you don't need the number on the back necessarily. What about this? What about, what do you call them, the shirt jersey, the T-shirt jersey? A T-shirt with a number and a name on the back. No, that's just lazy. Different. That's just lazy. You're spending less yeah. money for doing the same thing. <laughs> so, no. Oh, I don't know. I thought it was a know. good, maybe I'm a D-bag when it comes to jerseys. What do you think? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, too, like, I'm, I'm starting to get to the age where a lot of the kids I played with or played against are getting called up, and I could never wear their jersey. Um well, right, but here we go. good example. Humble, exa- Kirby. Humble it's, it's George Kirby. You know what? You, you know what no, I, I was actually going to go with Volpe this time, but that's okay. No, but so we're <laughs> we're at it. We're in a group of twenty kids, ten guys, ten girls. We're watching Kirby pitch, and some of the dudes are wearing Kirby jerseys. And it's just like you're going to sit next to a girl and wear the jersey of someone that like you grew up. Like what? I don't know. Now listen, if, I don't know how good a friend you are with Kirby. The whole show is a little suspect of this connection, but I don't know if you guys just went to school together or what's going on here. Recon. But if he was in your friend group, if he was in one of your five buddies that you hung with, I give you an exemption. You can wear his jersey. Yes, like you okay. can go full support for your tight buddy. But if he was in high school at the same time as you, and you guys talked three times, I don't want to hear more about George Kirby. <laughs> Well, I played I played against Matt Harvey back in the day, and I'm not wearing a Matt Harvey jersey. Let's just throw that out there. <laughs> um, we have one more. One All right, more. We've here. got one. Yep. All right. So we have uh, Irma is saying pajamas. No for men. Are okay, we- I've got some thoughts. Okay. I think Irma's on the right track. Whenever you put on pajamas, the wife makes you put them on at Christmas, right? You can feel it. I feel. Less. My testosterone is dropping. I feel horrible. And you know it and I know it. But, and so I've never been a pajama guy, by the way. I mean, outside of when I was a kid and I had the, man, those were awesome. What were those called when we were kids? The ones where you had like, 
a Yoda, f- you know, one or like a Superman one. Uh, was it underoos? The onesies? You had underoos back then? Yeah, onesies. <laughs> they, they weren't onesies. Uh. You had bottoms and tops, and they matched. I think anybody my age would know I'm talking about underoos. Uh, I, mean, I, I still wear them awesome. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> um, but I do think sleepwear at, at, at the age of becoming a man is difficult. Like, do you throw on just the pajama bottoms in the winter? I mean, but then they all get caught up. I don't, and you can't wear a t-shirt because then you, you twist and turn, it gets all wrapped around you in the wrong ways. And then, like, I don't. I think sleepwear has not been solved. I need good input on sleepwear. But then it comes full, full circle when you get older as a man. Older men wear those pajamas, and then it's acceptable. I think once you hit like maybe you know sixty five. I think you start wearing those like yeah, the those Tony pais- Soprano the Paisley look. ones or the Tony Soprano look, you know, that type of thing. So I think it comes. I hear around you on that. Again. You can wear that around the neighborhood. I think you go. Right, you go back to. You go back to like older um, movies and stuff, and you see like the the sleepwear. You know, the men getting up and they throw on the robe, and they, you know, I think that is probably what men should kind of go for. I, I mean, care, Grant. maybe a little less leisurely. Yeah. Um, what'd you say to me two days? I couldn't hear. It. I think you said something to me. Or, no, I said all right. I said all right, Cary Grant or Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Cary Grant. That's what Tinfoil. Tinfoil does. Does I mean I? Don't, I don't know the exact moment in time at which you would like to rewind the clock. It could be the 1950s, but um, I'm not sure when America was at its apex. That's for a future show. Here's the quick explosive pre-show debate, which I want to include you, the listener and the viewer of the Will Cain show in on. Should a man wear uh, boat shoes and loafers? Now, I think there's some regional variety in this going on, some geographic dis- uh, disparity. And I have a hard line. I don't like boat shoes. And I think they look no bueno when a grown man wears boat shoes. But I also don't like loafers. And I definitely don't like loafers with any metal on the top of them. You no know, bars or hoops or anything like that. And I don't want to, I, A, I don't like the preppy look. And B, I don't want to see the tops of your feet. I don't want to see pale, <laughs> veiny, skeletal feet. I don't want to see it. And, and I think that flip-flops are a different category of acceptability. But the loafer and the boat shoe, not manly. Yeah, see, this is, I think, one of your worst takes. Sorry. Uh, You know, I respect you a lot, and uh, you're a very smart guy. But uh, I think me and James here, we grew up in the Northeast. You wear boat shoes. I actually boat. I actually sail, and I use practical (laughs) ones. You can slip them them. on at any time. I actually need them. They're practical. I you could wear yeah. them to work. Okay, maybe Commodore. I do, maybe I do wear them with a suit sometimes. Who cares? You could wear them know. to the deli. But they are necessary. You could wear them taking out the trash. Yes, exactly. Whenever they're, you just slip them on. They're really so versatile. Simple. Throw on some Sperry's. Shout out Sperry's. Um, and yeah, I think me and no. James are just in the in the outs with this one with you guys. Well, but So young James, young establishment James, to be clear, is very Westchester. Like, it doesn't surprise me that he would throw on some boat shoes or some loafers. It, in Z, like, it fits right in. Like, James is who everybody said Duke lacrosse players were. You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you two a days, yeah. you're over there with the hoodie and the jean jacket. Like, you look like you're in a garage band on the, your off time, and yeah. you might be. And I think you have some tats. And you look like a Converse guy, like a Chuck Taylor Converse type guy. If you popped up to me with some pastel short shorts on and some bochos, it would be extremely disturbing. It would be extremely disturbing. Well, there's there's two sides of me, right? There's Country Club to Dan on the weekends, right? So that's where I go, you know, in the same town, actually, that James grew up in is where I go to a club. So that's one side of me. And then, yes, there is the... You know, musician side of me, so I can be versatile in those two different ways and oh, still exist chameleon. in the same world. <laughs> <laughs> and Patrick, you're anti flip flop. Hundred percent. I, I hate the well. Look, there are exceptions. You go into the beach. You're you're in a public shower, uh, like at the gym. Uh, you know, that's probably pretty much it. You're at a pool, and you, you know you have that long walk, and you don't want to burn the bottom of your feet. But, like, other than that, I, I hate when they pair them with jeans, you know. <laughs> um, 
so any specific. of that. Just total, totally trash look. So this is another one like the jersey that I'm going to own. I think you have a point, Patrick. I do. I saw a guy yesterday wearing flip-flops with skinny jeans, and I thought, bad look. Bad look. But if I'm being honest, I've, I've offended. Not the skinny jean part, but I've, I've offended. I've, I've done flip-flops and jeans before. I like the flip-flop. Hegseth's a big flip-flop and jean type guy. He's a big flip-flop Ooh. guy. Um, so, but I think you introduce a legitimate point, but it's, it's one for debate. Not like the loafer or the boat shoe. I think I'm a clear winner on that. All right, that's going to do it for me today. We've got our rule book running here on rules for men added to the Jesse Waters canon, and we'll work out what men should and should not do. You can jump into Will Kane Show or Will Kane X feed. Let us know what you think or comment on Instagram. See Will Kane or Will Kane Show. Until then, I'll see you again right here tomorrow at foxnews.com, Fox News YouTube, and Facebook channels for the next episode of the Will Kane Show. See you then. Oh, mm-hmm.